Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Yeah. Um, this is joint work with Mitali Bafna, Ravesh Kotari, who is my advisor, and Jeff Shu, and we are all from CMU. Uh, just, uh, huh? just uh, you just need to click on the last one. So oh, okay. Cool. Okay, so I'll jump right into uh, to our problem statement. So suppose we are given the coefficients of a degree six homogeneous polynomial of this form, sum of a t of x to the third power. And here, each of these a t's are unknown, uh, but we're given the sum of everything. We're given the coefficients of p. And here, we assume that the a t's are quadratic polynomials. So we, we can write a t as, as x transpose a t x, where a t is a matrix, n by n matrix. And we're going to abuse notation and write a t as both the polynomial and the, uh, the polynomial and the matrix itself. The goal is very simple. We want to find these, recover these unknown components a sub t. Now we can ask the question if the input has some noise, if you're given p hat, which is the same thing plus some error polynomial, e of x, and here we assume e of x is, is, is any arbitrary error polynomial. We want, we want the same, we want to find the components up to some error, but we want this error to, to go to zero as the noise of the input goes to zero. And we call the algorithm uh, resilient to inver inverse polynomial noise. If the error of the recovered components is bounded by some n times the norm of e to some uh, power, so polynomial of n and e. And of course, we can general, generalize this problem to larger degrees. So assume we have these powers and we each component at is degree k, we want, we want the same guarantees. So hopefully everything is clear by, uh, so far. But let me tell you why we studied this problem in the first place. Let's consider an easier problem when the components are linear. So each a t of x is an inner product between some vector v t and x. So we can see that uh, we can write the input polynomial as an inner product between two tensors. This is sum of v t tensor d and uh, x to the tensor d. We can write it this way. But this problem is equivalent to the normal tensor decomposition problem. Okay, and um, I think on Tuesday, Vishwas has already talked a lot about tensor decomposition. Um, I'll just briefly mention that there, uh, there have been, of course, many, many algorithms that work on tensor decomposition or, uh, in different settings. Um, in particular, if the VTs, the vectors are linearly independent, then there's an algorithm to recover these vectors in polynomial time and uh, while tolerating inverse polynomial noise. And of course, there are many applications to learning theory, for example, learning mixture of Gaussians, independent component analysis, diction learning, et cetera. These are like applications in statistical learning theory. So I want to focus on uh, learning Gaussian mixtures and ask what about non spherical Gaussian mixtures? Suppose now we have a mixture of Gaussians, but here um, the mix, there's some weight WT, and each component is a zero mean Gaussian with covariance matrix sigma t. And we, we uh, these, these sigma t's are, are unknown. We want to re, uh, recover these uh, covariance matrices given some samples from this distribution. Okay, so now let's consider any vector x uh, in n dimension, and we can look at the two D moment of um, in this direction. Okay, if we write it out, we can see that it's exactly of the form sum of w t times x transpose sigma t x to the d. So this is exactly the problem that we're looking at. It's the dth power of a sum of dth powers of quadratics. So what do, what, do, what do we do to recover these unknown covariances? We just simply estimate the moments from the samples we, we get. And then if we have an algorithm for our problem, then we can recover these covariance, covariance matrices. Okay, so this is uh, the, the, really the motivation of why we studied this problem in the first place, we are coming from the statistical learning background, and somehow uh, we are decomposing tensors. So for this talk, I'll mostly focus on cubics of quadratics, but when the power is d, d equals three, and each component is quadratic. Okay, at first glance, if you write out the input polynomial, you can see that this is an inner product between the sum of AT tensor three and X tensor six. So you might think that, oh, this problem is almost identical to the original tensor decomposition. And in fact, if we're, actually, we're given this sum of AT tensor three, then it's, equiv it's equivalent to tensor decomposition. But we actually don't have this because we only have the coefficients of P of X. 
So what we are actually given is we're given the symmetrized tensor, which we denote by sim, the symmetrization operator on the sum of AT tensor three. Yeah, so, um, and this, this I'll show you that this has a drastic effect. So we're actually given the coefficients. So if you look at the coefficient of this monomial X1 to X6 of AX, A of X to the third power, uh, the coefficient of this monomial and this polynomial is actually a one two a three four a five six plus a bunch of different terms. So you can see this is actually a sum over different permutations of one two six. Single symmetrization as like averaging over the entries of the tensor, which loses a lot of information. Here's a quick calculation. Um, originally, a tensor three roughly has n six to the twenty four dimension, uh, dimension. But after we do a symmetrization step. Uh, the operator acting on it. Um, the coefficient of a of x to the third only has around n to the six over seven and 20, 720 coefficient. So we can see this, we lose a lot of information after this symmetrization operator. And this has a, a very, uh, makes a very big difference for our, our algorithm and also even identifiability of this problem. And I'll show you an example later. Yeah. So uh, recall that for normal tensor decomposition, linear, inter linear independence of the components imply unique decomposition, uh, which was on Tuesday also showed you this by this uh, like generic algorithm, et cetera. But this is actually not true for us with symmetrization. Here's a very simple example, just degree two and only on two variables. Uh, there, these are two sets of degree two polynomials. Um, each set is linearly independent. And um, you can type this in Mathematica and see that they actually have the same sum of cubics. So this is a very simple example. Two variables show that even though these components are linearly in independent, their decomposition is not unique. So the main takeaway for, uh, from this example is that we need more assumptions on the input polynomial, or rather more assumptions on the component. So uh, let's see. So it's actually very crucial. Uh, this root six is exactly root six. If it's not root six, it's something else, then these two sums won't be uh, the same. So what we um, so what we can do is we can consider when the components are like kind of randomized. So here's the setting that we are considering in our in our paper and also in the in all the previous works. We consider that there are two cases. So um, when the ATs first are smooth polynomials, meaning that ATs is a sum of an, any arbitrary matrix plus some Gaussian matrix scaled by some row. And we also consider the case when the ATs are random. So it's just a completely random matrix with IID coefficients. So we can see that at least uh, by randomizing this matrix, these components a little bit, we won't have that like root six uh, counter example there. And this is also like the setting that like all previous works on this problem uses. Um, okay. So yeah, now I'll talk about some uh, two of the main, oh, two of our main prior works. First one is in 2015, Gu Huang and Kakade showed that for sums of cubics, uh, cubics which is D equal three of smooth quadratics, uh, they can recover the components when the number of components is smaller than root n. And the algorithm can tolerate inverse polynomial noise. So the upside of this algorithm is that it's very simple, like everything is linear algebra uh, and it's noise resilient. The downside is that their techniques have a natural barrier at uh, n, m roughly n, even if we're given higher power, higher power, uh, higher d. So if we're given higher d, we should be we should be given more uh, information. So we're supposed to be able to decompose more components. But their techniques uh, have a barrier at n, even if you're given larger d's. And this is because the algorithm needs to estimate the col uh, span of the columns of AT. So because AT is dimension n, uh, if, if, there, if m is larger than n, you can just get the whole space, and their algorithm is meaningless. There are other issues as well. Um, they actually need access to this other tensor, symmetrized uh, sum of AT, AT tensor 2 to get the span of the columns of AT. And of course, we don't have this. Okay, now I'll go into a, a recent work, uh, 2020. Gaur, Kyo, and Saha showed that for some of these powers of generic quadratics, they can recover the components when the number of components is smaller than n to the d over 1,000, when d is uh, large enough. 
this is a like amazing work, a breakthrough work, because the bound on M grows as D increases. This is the desired uh, property property that we want. We want as D increase, we also want to be able to decompose more. Downside is that the algorithm is not noise resilient. Uh, so they're um, in the work they like care about these algebraic kind uh, of reconstructing algebraic circuits. Um, they really only care about like finite fields. Um, but they asked the, this open this as an open question like can, is there an algorithm that is noise resilient and can recover like similar guarantees so they need this d0 to be like pretty large <laughs> so i'm sure like they didn't optimize these constants at all but it's pretty clear that uh, their algorithm has um does not work when d equals three yeah well we actually like calculate this uh you from their theorem statement and see that <laughs> Even for quadratics, they need this huge power, which is a constant. But, but here's a summary of both of these works. And the question is, can we get the best of both worlds? So let's see. We want an algorithm that's very pretty simple. And uh, simple, like meaning it's like easy to analyze the noise resilience. We want to beat this root n bound when d equals 3. And we want to uh, get some bound that increases as d increases. OK. So far, are there any questions? When you say that it's not working, you mean that the, the computer is that does not arrive at the end, or really that the algorithm fails? Uh, which algorithm? Ah, uh, you, you mean like when, when m is larger than this yeah. bound? Mm -hmm. So um, I, think, I think this bound might be because of their analysis is not tight. But if, the, if m reaches uh, n, then the algorithm doesn't work. Because they need to get the span of 80s, and the span of 80s is just the entire space and it's, it's meaningless. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Would you mind going back to your non uniqueness example? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, we can think of the A's as linear forms on a bigger space. They're like symmetric on like S2 of uh, vector space. Uh -huh. Right? So we have. Seems like the A's are linearly independent, so you have. I mean, this looks unique to me. I'm, I'm, I don't really understand why you don't get uniqueness from just the density composition. Ah, uh, yes, because it's because uh, for polynomial coefficients, there. Um, if you, uh, for example, if you consider x y times uh, x x squared y squared in the in the polynomial. It can actually come from x y times x y or x squared times x squared. Oh, sorry, x squared times y squared, and they they're mixed up. Does that make sense? Like each of these, we're only given the coefficients of the final polynomial. Yeah, and so for each coefficient, for example, x squared times y squared, this this monomial, the coefficient actually actually comes from uh, the sum of x y times x y and uh, x squared times y squared. It's the sum of these things. You know, as if you go back to, I think you are like agreeing that the space of which we're thinking there is three of is itself the S two. Is itself the S two? Yeah, but 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 if it weren't, of course, then we would have uniqueness. But but it's still a vector space, and you have linear dependence. Of... Yeah. Okay, but I think okay. once you write out it as a as a polynomial, you actually like merge a lot a bunch of different things. Yeah. You wrote like... any any field. Uh, I guess in any field is fine. Like this averaging thing is there for any field, but we mainly we we focus on the reals. Yeah, yeah. This averaging thing uh, is it averages a bunch of things and loses information. Yeah. So yeah. Um. I, I, yeah. This can be verified by Mathematica. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. I'll I'll move on. Okay. So now I'll talk about our results. So our first result is about random quadratics when each component is random. So when we're given given a sum of at of x to the d and with some error e of x, uh, we're able to out, uh, recover the components up to some error, which is polynomial in n and e. So in the case of d equals 3, we can get m uh, smaller than n. d equals 6, we get m up to n squared. And then for any d, we get this n to the 2d over 9. Don't worry too much about this 2d over 9. Uh, I, we think it's supposed to be d over 3. Uh, there's some technical subtleties that we faced for higher d's. So first of all, at d equals 3, we beat the root n bound from ghk, 15. 
And we also get the nice property that as M increases, uh, also M increases as D increases. And of course, this is uh, because it's poly N and E, so our algorithms toler can tolerate inverse polynomial noise. And of course, this, uh, our algorithm also generalized to higher degree polynomials so when, the, when each component is degree K. Now I'll talk about a uh, result for smooth. Now, if the, each component is smooth, which is like an arbitrary polynomial plus some Gaussian noise, each AT is uh, arbitrary plus some Gaussian matrix, then we get the same guarantees. But uh, here we only get inverse exponential noise. So this is not pretty good. Um, and yeah, it's our main open problem of whether we can get this down to inverse polynomial. And, and also this generalized to higher degree polynomials. And as an immediate application to mixture of Gaussians, we can, uh, we can show that if, the, if this mixture of Gaussians, where each Gaussian has zero mean and smooth covariance matrices, this is the, uh, the parameters are uniquely identifiable if we're given the first six moments of this distribution, when the number of uh, mixtures is smaller than n. And if we're given 2D moments, then it's uniquely identifiable when M is smaller than N to the order, order D. A note of caution, um, this does not imply an algorithm to learn Gaussian mixtures. This, this is only about uniquely identifiability. So this, this is, we cannot learn it because theorem two is not res resilient to inverse polynomial noise. It's only inverse, inverse exponential. So if we want to learn Gaussian mixtures, we need to estimate the, uh, the moments from the samples. And this estimation, gives us some error, which is inverse polynomial. So we need to be able to tolerate that. Yeah, so this is really our main next step to, to make this somehow make this robust to inverse polynomial noise. Okay, uh, so any questions so far? Then I'll move on to technical overview um, and I'll focus on cubics of random quadratics. So remember D equals three and then each component is quadratic and random. Here's a high level strategy from the previous work by Gu, Kwan, and Kakade. Their strategy is very simple. It's desymmetrized plus decompose. First step is they uh, given this symmetrized tensor, they just want to extract the desymmetrized tensor, sum of AT tensor three. And then once we have this, we will simply use some off-the-shelf tensor decomposition algorithm. And this will simply recover the com each component. So um, this the second step is known already. So all we need to do is focus on the first step. Remember, remember this. Symmetrization operator uh, reduces the dimension, it loses a lot of information. So uh, in general, we cannot hope to invert this operation. But when can we, we can do this if you're given some additional information. So the high level message is that if these vectors lie in some restricted, some smaller subspace, then this operation is, uh, is, is there's hope to re, uh, invert this operation. Desymmetrize means that you transform your tensor, your symmetric tensor, into a polynomial. Yes, uh, yes. So we're given a polynomial which can be represented as a symmetrized tensor. So you want to go back from S6 to S3 or S2? Uh, S3 or S2. Um, okay. Okay, uh, yeah, feel free to stop me any, any time. Yeah. Um, yeah, just remember if we were, we're, when we're given coefficients of the polynomial, we're actually given the symmetrized tensor, not the, not the actual tensor. Okay, so this is a pretty vague idea. And here's, in the next slide, I'll, I'll make this concrete. The main observation from GHK is that suppose we know the span of the ATs. And we're given the span of ATs as the basis B1 to BM. And remember, the span of ATs is just a subspace of n by n matrices. Then we can invert the symmetrization, and here's why. So this is the unknown sum. Uh, sum of AT tensor three is unknown, but now given the spaces, we can write this as sum of some coefficients d i j k times uh, b i tensor b j tensor b k. And because of this symmetrization operator is linear, uh, this is we can write this as the same linear combination times the sum of b i tensor b j tensor b k. And this second thing is known to us. So we can write this out, and this is just a linear system with roughly m cube variables. So C i j k, uh, these i j k's are indices in m, so they're roughly m cube, and they're n six equations because this tensor, uh, there are just this many entries in this tensor. 
roughly. So when m is much smaller than n squared, then we can hope to solve for these uh, coefficients. So I don't like it's not immediately clear that it can be solved, but um, we, like it can be shown that this linear system can be invertible. So G GHK they also use this uh, other tensor information, and they're able to obtain the span of the ATs and made it work when m is smaller than root n. But the main takeaway is really is finding the span of this is all we need. So at this point, I'll just give a brief overview of the algorithm. We're given this input, sum of AT of X tensor uh, to the third power. We find a span, a span of A1 to AN. And then we desymmetrize. And then we apply some off the shelf tensor decomposition. This is the uh, very high level of algorithm. So is there any, any questions so far? And so for, uh, and I will focus on this step span finding. So as a first step, maybe let's find a related object, which is this V by the span of AT of X times XI XJ. So this is a subspace of degree four polynomials. Each of each AT is degree two, and we are multiplying by a degree two monomial. Okay, so we can think of that as a degree four uh, space in the ideal of these polyn polynomials. Now we look at the main idea from GKS uh, 2020. We take second de partial derivatives from the input polynomial. And remember the input polynomial of the degree six polynomial. After we take two derivatives, we get degree four. And if we write it out, we can see that it's exactly this form, sum of AT times some degree two uh, Q, Q of X. So it's pretty easy to see that this uh, writing uh, from this expression, that this is contained in V bar. So we write this write U bar as a span of these uh, partial deri derivatives. It's pretty clear that U bar is contained in V bar. So if we can show the opposite direction that V bar is contained in U bar, then we'd be done. But you might guess that uh, this is, doesn't work because I put a bar on, on these uh, U and Vs. We face an immediate trouble because of dimension counting. The dimension of U bar is roughly N squared. The dimension of V bar is actually pretty large. It's roughly M times N squared because we have N, uh, because this T ranges from N and IJ ranges from N, uh, in our indices in N. But here's an idea. Why don't we just restrict the polynomial to a small set of variables? So we pick L to be roughly root N, and then we set the rest of the variables to be zero. So now we're gonna denote Y to be Y1 to YL, and we denote BT of Y to be this restricted uh, polynomial. This is just by plugging in Y1 to YL and setting everything to be zero. And we're going to define V to be the span of BT times YYJ. So now this is a span of a subspace of degree four polynomials in L variable. So it's, uh, we've done some variable reduction. U is the same as uh, partial derivatives, and then we just restrict these polynomials. So at least now the dimension counting uh, works out. U, uh, the dimension of U is still roughly N squared, but dimension of V is now roughly uh, N times L squared because we've reduced the number of variables to L. So, and when M L squared is smaller than N squared, and then we plug in L to be root N, we get M smaller than N. And this is the, and N is the sound that we're aiming for, for cubics of quadratics. And in fact, we will show that um, the, these two subspaces are indeed uh, the same subspace. And here it is important to note that we need to do the these restrictions after we take partial derivatives. So these, we, we still want the N squared partial derivatives, and then we do uh, restrictions later. Okay, um, any questions? Uh, here's just a very simple visualization of restriction um, because we're setting some variables to zero. So the, this restricted polynomial B sub T is just, uh, or this matrix BT is just the sub matrix of AT, the L by L sub matrix. And it's pretty important that because we assume AT have Gaussian, uh, IID Gaussian entries, this BT also has ID Gaussian entry, and this will be pretty convenient for us later. Now, our question is, suppose we know that uh, this subspace V, how do we find the span of BT? So we basically, we just want to shave out those the degree two monomials there. First thing, um, it would be nice if this subspace is a, has some nice structure, meaning uh, it's a direct sum of M different subspaces. Uh, each of these are V span of V, B, T, Y times Y, Y, J. 
uh, you can imagine that this is nice because if this is a direct sum, you can just you can easily decompose and do something. But this is not true. And it's not true for a very simple reason. For any S not equal T, uh, Bs times Bt lies in both uh, Vs and Vt. And remember, when I say zero sum, I just mean that uh, the, sub the subspaces have trivial intersection, so they only intersect at the zero polynomial. So, but clearly, this Bs times Bt both lie, lie in both of these subspaces. Okay, so this is not true, and we call these the obvious linear dependencies of the of of V. Okay. So it's really this reason, and of course, some other complicated steps in GKS that force them to go to much higher powers than d uh, than d equals three. So that in their work, they need they need a higher power version of v to be a direct sum of these n subspaces. And obviously, d equals three uh, is not true. So they need to go to a much higher powers. Our main observation is that this is actually okay if if these obvious linear dependencies are the only ones. And, and now we want to analyze the linear dependencies of these uh, polynomials. So we consider this equation, sum of Bt times Ct uh, equals zero, whereas each C1 to Cn are homogeneous degree two polynomials. So think of these as coefficients of the linear dependency. And uh, this is an obvious solution. So clearly Bs times Bt minus Bt times Bs is zero. And this is for any S not equal to T. So we only show that these solutions are the only solution. So uh, this is like we choose S different from T, set Cs to be Bt, Ct to be negative Bf, and then uh, set everything else to be zero. We want the span of these obvious solutions to be the only solution. Okay, and the first question is, is this even true? So it turns out it's actually not true if the Bt's are structured, and here's an example. Remember that Bt uh, is a degree two polynomial. So suppose B1 is a product of two linear polynomials, LA times LB, and B2 is LA times LC, so they share a common factor LA. Then we can take C1 to be LC times LD, and C2 to be negative LB times LD. This, is, this can be done for any linear polynomial LB. Then we can see that B1 times C1 is uh, LABCD, B2 times C2 is also negative LABCD. And this, because this works for any LD, uh, this is not uh, an obvious solution. But our the polynomials that we're given are not structured; they're kind of random. Um, so we we can prove that this is this property is actually true if the BTs are random. <clears throat> okay. Any question was about this sample? So algebraic geometric. So this set of this irregular. So if you take uh, the random set of quadratics, it's a regular sequence. Uh, uh, right. Ah, uh, and and that that implies that is precisely the same. Mm, okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, actually, yeah, I, I I can probably ask you about this a, a bit later. Yeah. So remember that we want to we want. Okay, remember B1 to BM are some matrices of A1 to AN, and so they have ID Gaussian entries. So, and we want to find the span of B1 to BM. This is a degree, a subspace of degree two polynomials from this degree four uh, subspace. What we can do is we can sample a random degree two B0, for, uh, which can, contains ID Gaussian entries, and we take this W, which is a span of B0 times Y, Yj, and we consider the intersection of these two subspaces. Now, for any polynomial in the intersection, we can write f as b0 times c0 for some, C, uh, for some degree 2 c0. We can also write this as sum of bt times ct, and cts are some other degree 2 polynomials. But now this we, we start this equation. We can see that uh, the, if we show that the obvious solutions are the only ones, then if c0 is not uh, is 0, then C0, C0 must lie in the span of B1 to, B, uh, B1 to Bn. Okay, so now we look, uh, so remember V intersect W is a subset of degree four polynomials, B0 is degree two. So we do this division, we get back the span of B1 to Bn. Okay, everything clear? So at this point, I want to just give an outline of the, of the algorithm to just as a recap. 
I think this is nicer than what we wrote in the paper. <laughs> okay, so we're given p of x, which is sum of a t of x to the third power. We take the second part of the rivers, and then we take the we take restrictions to some um, L variables y, and we take uh, we take the span of this. We're gonna we're gonna show that uh, u equals to v, which v is this subspace uh, span of b t times y y j. <clears throat> now we're given this v. We sample a random b zero uh, and take this uh, this subspace. We take the intersection y, y uh, w intersects v, and then divide by b zero, we get back the span of b one to b n. <clears throat> and then the last step here, the last step, we use the fact that the obvious linear dependencies are the only ones. And now I will tell you a bit about the parameters. Um, so here, you continuing v is obvious. We want the opposite direction. So we want that the dimension of v, which is roughly m l squared, to be smaller than n squared. And here, this step, we need that be, this is not the whole space. Remember, this is a span of a subspace in degree two polynomials. We don't want this to be the entire space. Otherwise, it, this is meaningless. So we need the m to be smaller than l squared. And combining these together, and we can set L to be root N, then we get N is smaller than N. And this is the bound that we want for cubics of quadratics. Okay, um, all good? So you might be wondering now that we, we only get back this span of B1 to Bn, and these are some matrices of A1 to Am. They're not the whole thing. So, but that's, uh, that's fine. We just need to repeat this for many different restrictions. So we uh, we to look at different restrictions to variables. We do the same thing. We get these spans, and we somehow aggregate them together, and we get back the full desymmetrized tensor sum of at tensor three. And here, um, this is pretty simple. This I won't go into the details of of this in this talk. We we just need we just need to show that um, we need to show a set of restrictions or a family of sets of variables of, of um, roughly root and variables. And there, we need to show there are only polynomial, polynomial of n of them. And uh, we show that once we have these, we can aggregate them to, to um, recover the full decentralized tensor. So yeah, I won't go into this in the talk, but it's not, not too hard. And of course, after we have the decentralized tensor, we just apply the usual tensor decomposition, then we are done. Okay, any questions? So in this moment, you don't take kind of random tensors of yes, like, so <laughs> you actually do it kind of deterministic. Yes, exactly. So um in that, 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 uh, very very good question. So um we try doing a random subsets of variables, but it uh, turns out that there's some errors. We we need this, we need to recover this exactly. Um, so we actually use a pseudo random set. Yeah, so it's, and uh, it can be poly, poly n number of them. Yeah. Okay, so I haven't uh, told you anything about noise resilience yet. We need to make every step of our algorithm robust to errors. The main observation is that our, uh, even though our algorithm has many, many steps, every step is some simple linear algebra operations. So to, uh, to understand the noise resilience of each step, all we need to do is analyze uh, some of these matrices that come up in the algorithm and found their condition number. And this we can do by proving single value upper and lower bounds uh, for these matrices. And we uh, view this as a major advantage over the previous, previous work because now every, at every step, we can write out these matrices explicitly and then analyze them. And to, in order to analyze these uh, matrices that arise, um, yeah, first of all, uh, these matrices are going to be structured matrices with correlated random entries. And by this, I just mean that each entry of the matrix is a low degree polynomial of the input A1 to AM. And so they have a low degree polynomial of Gaussians. And um, so in the past, I, people don't really know how to analyze these correlated random matrices. But recently, like in the last few years, there, is, there have been some developments of these so-called graph matrices, which allow us to analyze these matrices. It's a pretty new technique, and I'm gonna like briefly mention, talk about it uh, in the final part of the talk. Okay, uh, so the, for the rest of the talk, uh, I have 20 minutes. Um, 
I'm going to talk about the linear dependencies of V. I'm going to show you that the analysis reduces to bounding single values of a certain structured but random matrix. And I'm going to tell you the uh, high level strategy of how we analyze these um, single, the singular values. In particular, I'll show that proving single value lower bounds can be done by proving single value, value upper bounds. And we know a lot about single value upper bounds, so this is good. And I'm going to give a brief introduction of these graph matrices. Hey, so yeah, part one, linear dependencies of V. Let's uh, recall V1 to Bm are quadratic polynomials, uh, Y transpose BTY. They're in L variables. Uh, each BT is ID Gaussian, has ID Gaussian entries. We're going to look at this uh, linear dependency. So degree two polynomials C on to Cm, such that sum of BT times CT equals zero. Think of these as CTs as a coefficient of the linear dependencies. This is a linear equation with m L2 variables. Here I'm using L2 instead of L squared because it's not exactly, it's L plus one, two, two, which is the number of monomials in a degree two polynomial. And L4 equation, um, because it's a degree four polynomial. And L4 is also the number of monomials of a degree four polynomial. Yeah, just think of them as L squared and L4 for simplicity. So this is a linear equation, and we can just write it out as a, some matrix V times a vector C equals zero. So this, this V, it is, it, is, uh, it is tall, it has L4 rows and ML2 columns. So the, uh, the columns are indexed by T and index in M, J1, J2, and index, indices in L. And L4 are, in, uh, are indexed by I1, I2, I3, and I4, the indices in L. Each column is just a polynomial. So the T, J1, J2 column is just a coefficient of this polynomial, B, T of Y times Y, J1, Y, J2. So this is a degree four polynomial, so it has L4 coefficients, and we just line them up here. Okay, and we can write this out explicitly. So for example, uh, for entry Y1234 and T24, this is just the coefficient of this monomial in this polynomial, BT times Y2, Y4. So this entry is just BT13. Okay, so we can write this out, this matrix V out very explicitly. Now we look at, look at this, uh, the vector C. So because C is, uh, C consists of C1 is Dn, and each of them are degree two polynomials. We can uh, divide the C into chunks, M chunks, and each chunk is L2 dimensional. So each representing a degree two polynomial. And now we look at the obvious solutions. So the obvious no space of B. Uh, it's just as a reminder, CF, uh, we can set CF to be BT, CT to be negative BT, uh, sorry, negative BF, and then everything else to be zero. And there are M choose two of these obvious solutions. For example, if S equals one, T equals two, uh, we just put C1 to be B2 here, C2 to be negative B1. This is a, an obvious solution uh, to this equation, V C equals zero. So it's an obvious vector in the null space. But we just want to sh uh, show that these vectors are the only null space. So we can group these M choose two obvious vectors into a matrix. So uh, uh, there are M choose two of them. And I'm going to denote this as N transpose just for convenience later. So this matrix, um, the columns are actually uh, m different degree two polynomials. And the st column of n transpose is just this. We plug in uh, the, in the s slot, we plug in bt. And if at the t slot, we plug in negative bs. And everything else is, is zero. We just group these uh, obvious vectors into this matrix. And because they are, uh, these vectors are like pretty clearly lying in the null space of v, we can see that v times n transpose is zero. I want to show that these are the these vectors are the only solutions. So basically, that means the row space of row span of n equals the null space of v. This is what we want to show. So how do we do that? The main idea is to prove that this matrix v transpose v plus n transpose n. This is a square matrix. It's ML two times uh, ML two. This is four ring. We want to prove this is four ring. And because v, uh, these two v transpose v plus and n transpose n have orthogonal column span. If they sum up to a four rank matrix, then we know that uh, N must be the only you know, null space of, of B. <clears throat> yep. And in fact, in order to analyze error resilience, we need some to prove some lower bounds on the eigenvalues of this square matrix. 
So what I've shown you is I, uh, we reduce the analysis of the linear dependency of V to just a single value low bound of this specific matrix. And yeah, this matrix, we can write it out explicitly. It has correlated entries. Um, and so next, I will, I think I have 13 minutes. I will show you a rough idea of how we bound the singular values of these, these kind of matrices that arise in our analysis. Any questions? So the second part is singular value lower bounds. So here are some remarks about what we know. Um, we know that singular value upper bounds are pretty easy. There are many, many techniques like trace method, like matrix concentration, we know a lot of, about them. But for lower bounds, um, in the past, people used methods like leave run out to prove single value lower bounds. And this means uh, it's actually very simple. Like so single value lower bounds, like the minimum single value is kind of like a proxy for linear dependencies of the columns of the matrix. So if we show that, if we take out one column, we show that it's, the, uh, it's far away from the span of the rest of the columns. Then this shows that it's um, pretty far from linear dependency. And this is how people usually prove single value lower bounds. But this method is pretty uh, fragile. What they do is they take out the column and they said, oh, uh, they have like pretty independent randomness. So they showed, they just want to say that a random vector is far away from some, some fixed subspace. But this doesn't really work when the, uh, the matrix matrices have even some minor correlation. So anyway, I mean, it, it doesn't, like, uh, the analysis breaks down, yeah. So the key observation for us is that if this matrix is slightly rectangular, then we can actually prove singular value lower bounds by proving singular value upper bounds. And I'm gonna elaborate on this uh, later. Yeah. But here's a simple example. Uh, oh no, it's not an example. Uh, this is a strategy, sorry, <laughs> yeah. So the, our strategy is to reduce single value lower bounds to a single value upper bounds. So let's consider this G, which is a fat matrix, and we look at GG transpose. Our strategy is to show that GG transpose is just some scaling of the identity plus some error. So first we prove that the diagonal of the GG transpose are concentrated around sigma, and then we want to bound the off diagonal part. So suppose so we can bound the operating norm of the off diagonal to be little o of sigma with high probability, then it's pretty clear that GG transpose is pretty, almost the same as uh, the identity matrix, a scaled identity. And actually this is something, proves something stronger. It actually proves that the, both the max and smooth eigenvalue is close, uh, are close. So the condition number is one, roughly one. Yeah, so this is a, just a very simple example, uh, a Gaussian matrix K times N, and uh, we assume K is much smaller than N. So here, um, the diagonal is very easy. The diagonal of GG transpose is just roughly N. This is very easy by concentration inequalities. And now, uh, we turns out that we can show the up diagonal part is the operator norm, uh, sorry, the up, up, operator norm with the up di diagonal can be bounded by root KN. So when K is uh, smaller than N by some polylog factors, then we can show that sigma of, sigma min of G is larger than one minus little of one times root n. So this poly n over poly life n is what I mean by slightly rectangular. So usually uh, in, in, our, in most of our matrices, matrices in our paper, the diagonal is pretty easy. This is, it just follows from some concentration inequalities. The hard part is the out diagonal. And in fact, the most, most of our work is to down the off, diag off diagonal of the, these matrices that arise in our analysis. So to do this, uh, remember that this leave one out thing doesn't work. So we resort to the trace method. And I think uh, most people know this already. Um, I'll just quickly go over this. Um, a matrix M's operator norm raised to the R is, can be bounded by trace of M to the R. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, if M is random, we can bound the expectation of trace of M to the R. And then we can, and then by Markov we can give a high probability bound. So yeah, I don't think we need to go into that. Um, it's just counting close blocks. Um, I'll, I'll skip this part. So actually, most high bounds for random matrices uh, that I know of, at least, are proved this way using the trace method. And these, like uh, in the sum of squares literature that uh, my advisor is, uh, works on, uh, these random matrices with structural correlated entries arrive pretty naturally in 
when studying some squares lower bound. And previously, um, what people, how people analyze this is using the trace method. The trace method is a, a, a main way to bound the, the norms of these uh, structurally correlated matrices. It's actually the only way I know, know, know how to bound them. And turns out that, um, and because trace method is roughly equivalent to Kambunhor counting uh, closed closed walks, so they, uh, they've shown that the norm bounds of these matrices can be determined by a certain combinatorial structure of some weighted graphs or shapes representing these matrices. So, and that's why they call these graph matrices. And I'm going to show you an example. Let's go back to the easy Gaussian matrix. Uh, we have, we write out GG transpose. We, we can draw out a, a graph. So, um, so this looks a bit weird at first. Uh, if the circle vertices have labels in K, square vertices have labels in N. But the main, main message is that given a matrix, once you write out the coefficients, uh, we write out the entries. You can just look at it and draw out a graph. And similarly, given a graph, you can read out the matrix entries. So I won't go into too much detail. Uh, I'm running out of time. Um, basically, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between matrices and these structured matrices and these graphs. And um, think of these graphs as just a different way to represent the matrix. So, so why do we draw this out? It's because once we draw the graph, it's actually pretty easy to, uh, to get the norm bound of this matrix using the graph matrix, matrix machinery. And so I actually won't explain how this is done, but once uh, we, it takes some time for us to be familiar with this machinery. But once we're familiar with it, we can just, uh, and we write out the matrix, we can draw the shape, and then stare at it, and then know what, uh, what the bound is, norm bound is. Yeah, so in this case, uh, I think it's, it's pretty easy to see that it's bounded by root kn. And so this implies that when k is the smaller than n by some polylog factors, this gg transpose is roughly uh, n times identity. <clears throat> okay. So that's, uh, this is the, the last, uh, last technical slide. So remember, we are trying to bound this uh, very explicit matrix, v transpose v plus n transpose n. And I'm not going to go into details, but just here's a taste of what some of these shapes look like in our analysis. This looks like this. And uh, it looks a bit scary at first, but like it takes some time to get be familiar with this. But once we write out the matrix entries and then we, uh, we can draw this out, we can still write it and we get, we get a norm bound. <laughs> yeah, we can easily bound the norm by L squared. So really like all, Everything we do in the paper, uh, like uh, the single value analysis part, is to systematically characterize these matrices. We want to characterize the graphs uh, that arise in our analysis. And like we have a kind of systematic way to analyze the norm bounds of these matrices. Yeah, it will turn out to be like very combinatorial, um, which is pretty, pretty nice. Okay, so that's the end and um, just a summary of the talk. Uh, this is the outline. Um, we focus on span finding set. And we, uh, we, we saw that this analysis can be reduced to showing single value lower bounds of some explicit matrix, this, this matrix. And we prove single value lower bounds by proving single value upper bounds. And uh, yeah, uh, we saw a brief introduction of the great graph matrix machine machinery. So that's it. So thank you. And these are some other graphs that are ready. Higher degree power sums. Higher degree? Yeah, like uh, degree four and so forth. Yeah. yeah, so we actually generalize everything uh, to higher degrees. And it's a lot of work, but uh, yeah, we managed to, to do it, yes. <clears throat> Actually, higher degree is why our paper is so long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This graph matrix machinery is uh, what you said. I'm not sure what I want to say. Uh, so you count, you count paths. Uh, uh, yes. And you use graphs to get bounds for, 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 to, S, to, to get an S. Uh, an S made of the. Expected value of some normal. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, actually, like. 
It's a very simple thing is the norm bound is determined by the uh, so called minimum vertex separator. I want to separate, want to choose a vertex set that separates every path going from the left to right. Mm -hmm. So we just stare at this and show that, oh, maybe, maybe this is the, the separator. And then you can just write out the norm bound. Yeah. So, yeah, it was actually like a bit scary at first to understand this, but once we're familiar with it, it's actually not too bad. Like, we write out every, every matrix, we draw everything out, and then we just stare at it. Yeah. It's tight. It could be it's tight. It's, it's, it's very tight. Yeah. Um, like the method is generally. It's tight up to polylock factors, actually. Yeah. Because what they do is they, they, they use trace method and they look at walks on these, these things. So, like, the minimum step, step, vertex separator is kind of like, how you do a, a, a close walk. Hey, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.